Nowadays, interstellar travel, colonization of other planets, or at least a flight to the edge of the solar system seems very unlikely. The basic laws of physics simply do not allow this to happen, or it takes a very long time. It so happens that any long-range mission will take more than one generation. For example, an ordinary rocket can fly to Mars in six months, to Neptune in 30 years, and the nearest star system to us, Proxima Centauri, will take 80,000 years. What can a fragile little man hope for? But not everything is so unfortunate, and still mankind has achieved good results in the field of space. For example, the Parker Solar Probe managed to develop a speed of almost 700,000 kilometers per hour. Undoubtedly, this is an incredible speed, but unfortunately, people have not yet learned to build rockets with such speeds, and the usual probe cannot put a man in it. What do we do? Can we get faster, though not to other stars, but at least to the nearest planets? There is an old development that was invented half a century ago. With the help of this technology, the flight interval can be reduced considerably. It's a nuclear engine. Let's take a look at what a flight to Mars would look like with a simple chemical engine. We separate from the Earth, fly into Earth orbit, then plug in the engine and move in the opposite direction from the Sun. The unusual elliptical sphere, on which we pass the way to Mars for eight months, is called the Gomanovsky transition. One effective technique for moving through space is to minimize fuel and maximize payloads. After all, astronauts need food, water, air, are affected by cosmic radiation during the long flight. Add to that the return trip. In the early 60s, NASA and the Nuclear Energy Council came up with a system for calculating nuclear thermal force, and scientists carried out a number of successful tests of nuclear thermal engines, thus verifying their functionality. Newton's third law of Newton says about equal inverse drag, so the rocket is speeding in the direction of inverse gas escape. The nuclear engine works by similar rules. Hydrogen is fed from the tank into the reactor core, where it passes through channels heated by the nuclear decay reaction heated to high temperatures, and then ejected through the nozzle, creating jet thrust. The thrust is so great that the efficiency is 2.3 times that of a chemical rocket engine. Traveling on such an engine would take 8 months, and nuclear thermal rocket engines would reduce that period by a factor of 2. And it will be possible to get to Mars in 3 months, which means that astronauts will need less potential cost and will be less exposed to radiation. Another plus. With a nuclear rocket engine, it is possible to travel from Earth to Mars without waiting for the red and blue planets to be as close as possible to each other. With a chemical engine, if you miss the necessary period, you will have to wait as long as 24 months. But with a nuclear rocket engine, flight cannot be canceled. The first tests of the nuclear engine started in 1955, the key task of which was to reduce the size of the reactor to such an extent that it could be implemented in rocket engines. Because of the great distance of flight time, it was decided that nuclear engines would make these flights the closest to reality. Naturally, nuclear propulsion has its own dangers. The reactor on the ship is a source of dangerous radiation, which can be bad for the crew, but by reducing the flight time, the dose will be lower. There was also nuclear rocket technology in the project to fly humans to Mars. Powerful nuclear engines were being tested in the deserts of Nevada, ejected at high velocity into the gas element. The engines were tested 28 times for 115 minutes. Eventually, tests were organized for the Phoebus II, a nuclear reactor, capable of producing 4,000 megawatts during a 14-minute launch. Everything was ready for a mission to Mars, but the U.S. changed its mind about going there. Instead, they decided to build a space shuttle. And after that, no one had tested nuclear propulsion since 1973. Over the years, technology has gotten better, and now building something similar looks even more realistic. Since in the 60s, the propellants used were enriched uranium. Now engineers believe that a simple fuel for nuclear power plants will do. It is not dangerous, and the list of test sites where it is possible to carry out checks is much more extensive. In addition, it will be much easier to isolate radioactive particles at the output. Thanks to this, it is possible to reduce the overall price of the project. Researchers from Princeton University 
are investigating a theory of direct fusion called direct fusion drive, or DFD. The basis of their research is a fusion reactor that applies the principle of reversed magnetic configuration. The reaction of helium and deuterium plasma occurs in a magnetic container. As a result, we spend much less energy and we have an order of magnitude less radioactive waste. In nuclear rocket engines, propellants are heated up to a high degree and ejected, creating thrust. It works like this. Put a certain number of linear magnets, delaying the heating of the plasma, special antennas around the substance are tuned to a specific frequency of ions, with the help of which a current is formed in the plasma. The activity of the ions builds up the characteristics of the atoms, which combine to form fresh particles. These particles move in a magnetic field until they are joined by other particles and thrown through the nozzles of the rocket engine. On a theoretical level, a nuclear rocket engine can guarantee a thrust of 2.5 to 5 newtons per megawatt of power and a specific impulse of 10,000 seconds, compared to 850 seconds for a conventional nuclear engine and 450 seconds for a chemical engine. DFD can still generate electricity to a galactic vehicle far from the sun. When solar panels are not involved, DFD has the ability to move an object weighing 10,000 tons to Saturn in two years or something weighing 1,000 tons to Pluto in four years. The New Horizons station took 10 years to do this. The DFD, among other things, is a one megawatt fusion reactor, and when traveling through space, it has the ability to power all the equipment on board. Now let's talk about the ion thruster. The principle of its operation is simple and complex at the same time. It consists in the ionization of gas, which is accelerated by an electrostatic field to obtain reactive thrust and acceleration of the spacecraft according to Newton's third law. The fuel or working body of such an engine is ionized inert gas. However, not all noble gases should be used as fuel. So, as a rule, the choice of scientists and researchers falls on xenon. When the engine is running, a mixture of negative electrons and positive ions is produced in the chamber. Since the electrons are a byproduct, they have to be filtered out. To do this, a tube with cathode grids is introduced into the chamber so that it attracts electrons to it. Positive ions, on the other hand, are attracted to the extraction system. They are then accelerated between the grids, whose electrostatic potential difference is approximately 1,200 volts, and ejected as a reactive jet into space. In terms of benefits, the ions at the exit of the engine are accelerated to very high velocities. At their maximum, they can reach 210 kilometers per second. At the same time, chemical rocket engines are not able to reach 10 kilometers per second, being in the range of three, five kilometers per second. The ability to achieve a large specific impulse allows a very large reduction in the consumption of reactive mass of ionized gas compared to the same indicator for traditional chemical fuel. Also, the ion engine can run continuously for more than three years the energy needed to ionize the fuel is taken from solar panels. There are no problems with this in space. However, the possibility of continuous operation of the ion engine is very important because it is not able to develop high thrust and instantly accelerate the ship to high speeds. In current implementations, the thrust of ion engines struggles to reach 100 millinewtons. Because of this design feature, at least for now, such an engine does not make it possible to launch from another planet, even if it has very little gravity. It turns out that the use of such engines for long-distance travel is not yet possible without traditional chemical-fueled propulsion systems. But, their joint use will allow much more flexible use of acceleration. For example, at the expense of a conventional engine to accelerate the device to a less high speed, and then accelerate even more at the expense of the ion drive. Unfortunately, all of these engines we've already talked about are only suitable for exploring the solar system, but certainly not for traveling to other stars, because their speeds are still low, and even if we could reach the speed of light, we'd still be unable to reach other star systems. But maybe we should try to find a way to break the laws of physics, or at least find a workaround that will allow us to travel to distant stars and explore new worlds? After all, the future already seems almost inconceivable to us without space exploration. Of all the ways to travel, from the classic sending of ships on conventional jet propulsion, to the use of space sails, 
giant lasers, and antimatter rockets, warp drive is probably the only technology that currently has a realistic chance of getting to the nearest stars in the shortest possible time. Warp drive can safely be called the most realistic way of traveling above the speed of light of any known method. In addition, recently in this area, researchers have made a lot of progress, although so far mostly only in the form of formulas on paper. But let's move from fantastic ideas to practical observations and discoveries. So, of course, a vivid example of the use of warp drive is the universe Star Trek. According to the fantasist's idea, a starship equipped with such technology moves through space at a speed greater than the speed of light and thus overcome interstellar distances in an acceptable amount of time. But how? Briefly, the warp drive warps space in such a way that space behind the ship is inflated and space in front of the ship is compressed. This puts the ship inside what is called a warp bubble, in the sphere of a separate region of warped space. And yes, the ship relative to the warp bubble is stationary, and moves the warp bubble itself, along with the ship. According to one theory, a possible real warp engine would redistribute the so-called dark energy in the space encompassing the ship, creating an excess of it behind the ship, and conversely, a lack of it in front of the ship. According to the model known as the Alcubierre bubble, this warping of space is achieved through the use of relativistic effects described by the general theory of relativity. As we know, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity shows us how massive energy distorts space-time, this curvature we experience as gravity. But what if a spaceship could compress space in front of it and expand it behind it? Back in 1994, Miguel Alcubierre, a theoretical physicist, showed that the compression of space-time in front of a spaceship and its expansion behind it is mathematically quite possible within the laws of general relativity. So, what does that mean for a spaceship with this technology? Here's an example. Imagine that the distance between two points is 10 meters. If you are standing at point A and can move at 1 meter per second, it will take you 10 seconds to get to point B. However, let's say you can somehow compress the space between you and point B so that the interval is now only 1 meter. Then, moving in space-time at a maximum speed of 1 meter per second, you can reach point B in 1 second. That is, in theory, this approach does not contradict the laws of relativity, since you are not moving at a speed greater than the speed of light in the space around you. However, the formulation of this idea in the language of the general theory of relativity immediately gives rise to big practical problems. First, to deform space-time so radically, we would need to squeeze a huge mass into a bubble bounded by a wall thinner than an atomic nucleus. Also, we would need two forms of matter to support the bubble. The gravity of ordinary mass would make the space in front of the bubble shrink, moving the whole structure forward, but at the same time, the space behind the bubble must expand. According to Alcabierre, for this expansion to occur, some form of negative energy would be needed, radiating a kind of anti-gravity. And to create negative energy, the warp engine must use a huge amount of mass to create an imbalance between particles and antiparticles. But for the warp drive to generate enough negative energy, we'd need a lot of matter. Alcubierre calculated that a warp engine with a 100 meter bubble would require the mass of the entire visible universe. But physicist Chris Van Den Broek showed that increasing the volume inside the bubble while keeping the surface area constant would greatly reduce the energy requirement to about the mass of the sun. A significant improvement, but still far beyond all practical possibilities. It turned out to be quite difficult to obtain a substance with negative mass, which must have negative energy. Moreover, something similar is simply not observed in the universe. However, on the basis of the Bose-Einstein condensate, a substance was obtained in the laboratory that exhibits some negative mass properties, but in a very small volume. The researchers then cooled rubidium atoms to almost absolute zero. In a Bose-Einstein condensate, the particles behave like waves and so propagate in a different direction than normal particles of positive effective mass should. Of course, although the warp engine does not contradict the laws of physics, its construction involves gigantic complexities. 
First of all, most of the models developed require an exotic substance with negative energy. Such a substance not only needs to be created in large quantities, but also to learn how to control it. It is known that quantum objects possess some properties of such substance. For example, the Casimir energy, energy of zero-point quantum fluctuations of vacuum. Moreover, the manifestation of this negative Casimir energy was observed in real laboratory experiments, when researchers even managed to get the first real photo of the warp bubble. Maybe some small quantities of such a substance can indeed be produced, but to create a warp engine requires simply gigantic energy resources. Still, some astrophysicists have proposed optimized versions of the Alcubierre bubble, which requires less negative energy to create. If it is possible to find exotic matter in the amount of only 33 Earth masses, then we can think about building a warp engine. It is difficult to say when humanity will have such technological capabilities and whether it will live to see those times. It is probably hundreds or even thousands of years away. There is no doubt that the universe is still too big for humans to cross. But perhaps someday it will be possible to shorten the travel time, despite the enormous technological challenges. Advances in science are opening up possibilities that were never even thought of before. And in some cases, they were even foreseen by science fiction writers. Therefore, we hope that the warp drive for interstellar flights is just from such a series, and someday, such projects will be realized. What do you think about it? Share your opinion in the comments. In the meantime, you can take a look at the technologies that will become a reality in the coming years.